The 6 o'clock news starts right now. Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf say with COVID cases continuing to rise, they're recommending even vaccinated people wear a mask in public indoor settings. Metro Health sending out a text alert today saying the same thing. Health officials, city and county leaders making this announcement during a COVID update press conference today. And though Governor Greg Abbott has blocked local mask mandates, city and county leaders are asking Abbott to at least allow governmental employers and schools to be able to require masks. But Garrett Berger says that's not all. He joined us live. Garrett, what else are they hoping to get from the governor? Well, they say that they put in a request for additional nurses to help staff the hospitals, as right now there are 629 people in area hospitals with COVID-19. That's up from 125 on June 16th, just six weeks ago. Now, the head of the organization that oversees the area's emergency health care system says hospitals were already seeing higher volume in general and dealing with staffing issues. Now, 15% of their hospitalized patients are COVID positive. With 95% of the hospitalized COVID patients being unvaccinated, the chief medical officer for University Health says nearly every COVID patient admission is completely preventable. Healthcare staff witness this every single day and it's very, very frustrating. As we've shared, patients with COVID that are sick enough to require admission to the hospital are almost exclusively unvaccinated. So if you've not yet received this life sparing and widely available safety measure, it's time to do so. Vaccination efforts locally have stalled as of late, though they still need to verify the full list. Metro health officials told us there are 120,000 people who are overdue for their second dose of the vaccine. Now, the mayor urged vaccinated residents to talk with their unvaccinated family and friends to urge them to go out and get their dose to make sure that the community as a whole can be safe. Live at City Hall, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. Texas border lawmakers urging the Biden administration to prioritize the health and safety of border agents and border communities amid a COVID-19 surge. Congressman Henry Cuellar says dozens of Border Patrol agents are testing positive for COVID-19. Our Tiffany Huertas has more on the situation on our southern border. They need to stop letting people in. Congressman Henry Cuellar says nonprofit organizations along the southern border don't have enough capacity for all the migrants coming into the U.S. With COVID cases on the rise, Cuellar is concerned about the safety of Border Patrol agents. Just last week, just in the Valley alone, they had over 20,000 encounters. He says 80 agents in the Rio Grande Valley sector have tested positive for COVID-19. Congressman Tony Gonzalez also side. worried. We have to protect our federal, uh, our federal agents that are doing the work. Gonzalez says agents and law enforcement on the border need more resources. The number one thing that we have to do is we have to secure our southern border. Number two, as these migrants come over, they must be processed, they must be tested, and we have to ensure that we're not releasing COVID positive migrants into any community. U.S. Customs and Border Protection says it provides migrants with PPE and migrants are required to keep masks on at all times. If anyone shows signs of illness, they are referred to local health systems for testing, diagnosis and treatment. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. A White House spokesperson says the Department of Homeland Security is ensuring that families and adults released from DHS custody are COVID tested and isolated. Once again, masks will be required at the Bear County Courthouse. We spoke with local administrative judge Ron Ron Hell, who says he plans on filing an order. The judge says that's all due to the increase in COVID cases in Bear County and also because he has the authority to do so. Public officials like Judge Nelson Wolf, like the mayor in San Antonio, are unable to issue any sort of restrictions as it relates to COVID. Those orders, which we all agree, do not apply to the judiciary. As a result of that, I have the ability to mandate mass in the courthouses, which I do intend to do. Judge Ron Hell says he plans to file that mask order tomorrow and it will take effect immediately. To the Otis McCain trial now, four days. That's how long the judge is giving McCain's defense team to look over content found on McCain's cell phone. The prosecution presented that content during the second day of the punishment phase in this trial. The findings were shown without the jury present. 
On McCain's phone were screenshots of articles about SAPD Detective Benjamin Marconi's murder, videos of how to take apart a Glock pistol, and photos of other officers from around the U.S. who had been killed on duty that same year. Whether that would be admissible to the jury as evidence sparked a debate between the state and the defense. This is the first time we've seen any of this. And now they dump it on us and say, okay, here it is, get ready. I mean, I, I feel like they've had it for years, and at least one of them for over a year, and a year and like, what, 15, 16 months, and we're just hearing about it now, Judge. On Monday, McCain was found guilty of shooting Detective Benjamin Marconi in the head in 2016, as he sat in his patrol car riding a ticket. He faces the death penalty in this capital murder case. The punishment phase of the trial is scheduled to resume Monday morning at 9. Continuing coverage now on a standoff that led to a fatal shooting Monday night. A 29-year-old woman died as a result. Now SAPD unsure whether she died before or after officers opened fire on the suspect who was allegedly holding her hostage. Chief William McManus gave this major development during a press conference earlier. Police were called to an apartment on Roosevelt Avenue about a suicidal man identified as Angel Sanchez, threatening to kill his wife, Nieta Tiarina. She was the shooting victim. When police arrived, they learned that Tiarina and her three children were being held hostage. During the standoff, police say Sanchez came out multiple times armed with a shotgun and wearing body armor, trying to start a confrontation with officers. The last time he exited, he pointed his gun at police. That's when officers located on a nearby apartment building roof opened fire on Sanchez, hitting him. When officers entered the apartment, the woman was dead. Bear County Medical Examiner performed an autopsy this morning, and while they cannot yet conclusively state that Neda died from uh, as a result of the officers firing on the suspect, the physical evidence appears to support that conclusion. At one point, police say Tiarina, the woman, was urged to come outside, but she wouldn't leave because her children were still inside. The chief offered his condolences to the family. Police say Sanchez has a history of domestic violence. He's in the hospital facing three counts of aggravated assault on a public servant. The San Antonio police need your help in identifying a suspect accused of robbing the Pronto Insurance Office located off Southeast Military Drive. And take a look at the suspect captured on security video. The incident happened back on July 15th, just after 3 p.m. Police say the suspect walked into the office, waved a gun at an employee and demanded money. The suspect left with an unknown amount of cash. Anyone with information asked to call Crime Stoppers at the number on your screen, 210-224-7867. After five years, the family of Isaac Orozco is still looking for answers in his unsolved murder. Today, the family held a rosary balloon release in honor of the 20-year-old. He died back on July 28, 2016, when he was gunned down on Northwest Crossroads Boulevard. His mother, Janie Esparza, says that she will continue to seek justice and doesn't plan on stopping until her son's killer is caught. New information on a shooting incident where one man died after being taken to the hospital. The Bear County Medical Examiner's Office has identified him as 47-year-old Rudolfo Alderete. The incident happened Sunday morning around 4 a.m. when Alderete arrived at Texas Vista Medical Center with gunshot wounds. He was later taken to University Hospital where he died from those injuries. Details of the shooting are limited, however. Police believe it happened around Marbach and military. Let's take a look outside with live cam right now. 92 degrees, another day in uh, this warm and sunny pattern. Adam? Yeah, warm and sunny, but not exceptionally hot, especially by uh, July standards. You know, we were only in the mid-90s again today, and that's near average, actually a few degrees shy. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, right now, we're at 92 degrees. Feels like it's 97 when you tack on that humidity. And a couple of showers have popped up this afternoon, some closer to the Gulf Coast line. And especially in the hill country, we've seen some activity over the past couple of hours, just barely dotting the landscape farther to the west and northwest of San Antonio. They're isolated, quick, splash and dash. That's what we're seeing, and they're not going to last all that much longer. We lose our sunshine, we lose the daytime heating, we lose those showers. Right now we're 90 degrees in Bulverde and Canyon Lake. Bandera's 93, 91 Seguin and Rio Medina. We'll talk about our 
temperatures if they're going to warm up all that much and also our next chance of rain, which is just around the corner. We'll see you in a bit. Hey, coming up at six after weeks of heavy rain, we're checking back in on the flooding damage on Pin Road. And next, conversations about safety on the city's east side. What one local nonprofit hopes to get out of a discussion today. Public safety brought community leaders together today for a panel discussion. It's an effort led by the local nonprofit SAGE, which champions growth on the city's east side. Stephen Cavazos there as concerns led to conversations. Here at the Red Berry Estate is where local leaders answered questions about what can be done to improve the quality of life for not just businesses, but neighborhoods on the city's east side. Local nonprofit San Antonio for Growth on the East Side, otherwise known as Sage, hosted the event as part of the East Side Business Briefing. The panelists included Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar, San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood, along with representatives from the San Antonio Police Department and Metro Health. The panel answered questions ranging from mental health, crime, and homelessness. Another talking point was the pandemic and encouraging residents to get vaccinated. Sage President Tuesday night says, despite the pandemic, conversations about public safety and welfare have have not stopped. It is bringing people together in a interesting way through the pandemic. Obviously, we're being safe, but it is absolutely information that's needed and absolutely information that needs to be shared with the community. Knight says the organization recently raised money and were able to invest $1,000 to the Eastside Education Training Center, which helps residents who are hoping to get back in the workforce or achieve their higher education goals. Now, Knight does also add that she hopes that the community can erase a stigma which she believes surrounds the city's east side. But she says that first starts by having the right conversations. Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Drivers on the west side dealing with some detours as Saws works on sewer lines in the area near Leon Creek. Yeah, those same areas saw major flooding earlier this month. Samuel King joined us now. Samuel, did the flooding impact things there? And if it did, what happens now? Well, that's both interesting questions there, Steve and Myra, and it's not as much as first thought when it comes to that flooding and officials are hopeful any delays caused by the flooding won't make too much of a difference when it comes to the final product. Several inches of rain in just a short amount of time meant severe flash flooding earlier this month on Penn Road near Leon Creek. The timing not especially good for saws as it continues to replace sewer lines in the area. A spokeswoman says the flooding caused some delays as crews had to clean up debris caused by the flood, but no major construction was damaged. Crews have been able to resume work, and that means the section of Penn Road between Brown Leap Street and State Highway 151 Access Road is closed, except for access to an elementary school and some businesses. I don't live in the area. But so you weren't aware? No, I wasn't aware of it, no. And that work is still causing confusion for drivers. We saw many, like Virginia Segovia, looking to pass through and finding their way stopped by construction. The 151? Uh-huh, yeah. So but I have to go back the other, I have to go back the other way now, so, yeah, I don't want to go through there. <laughs> and Saw so says the Leon Creek 151 Highway 90 project is still ahead of schedule by a little less than a year, about 300 days. No word on how much longer the detours will stay in place. We'll keep you posted. As for traffic in the area this evening, things looking fine at this stretch of 151. This is 151 at Loop 410 as we head over to the traffic wall this evening. But we do have some issues on 151. That includes a crash here uh, near Westover Hills Boulevard there. So that's causing a delay 20 minutes now to get from 90 to 1604. Also a crash, as you saw here, 90 at 1604. So uh, very busy uh, this evening. Also some delays on the Loop 410 here in the northwest side, 21 minutes uh, from the north side, 281 to I-10, only four minutes the other direction, some major traffic there as well. Also downtown, we have a crash. This is I-10 at Colorado that's causing some delays, especially once you get inside 1604, uh, now to 25 minutes between 1604 and downtown. Just to give you an idea, only 12 minutes heading the other direction. We have a couple of views of that on Transguide here, so let's take a look. Uh, this is I-10 at Brazos. You can see that lane there closed. Also, I-10 at Frio gave you two views of this crash here, so you can definitely uh, see the situation here that is causing some delay. So a busy evening out there, so if you're at home looking to head out or someone who may need to head to work uh, this evening on the late shift, you might want to wait just a little bit because we still got a lot of delays in the area, guys. Thank you, Samuel. 
All right, so 92 degrees out there right now. Like we said, Adam said not bad for a late July day, but wondering if we're going to see any real big increase in these temperatures. Yeah, right now, it doesn't look like it, actually. We're going to stay a little below and near average for the time being, and even the extended outlook as we get into the first week and a half of August would indicate Really no big spike in temperatures. So today we topped out at 93 degrees. That's three degrees below average and our morning low was exactly average at 75. Del Rio made it to 100. Catula a high of 97. Kerrville 93. New Braunfels topped out at 94. Nothing abnormal for this time of year. Let's take a look at the month as a whole and look at that. We're running about 2.7 degrees below average for the overall temperature. And you look at all those blue days, those days shaded in blue. Those were days where the average temperature of the day was below average. The only time we were actually above average was July 3rd, and we made it up to 95 on that day. You look across the state, by July standards, not bad. Del Rio at triple digits, but Brownsville only 93 along with Corpus Christi. Actually, a little bit of shower activity, especially in Brownsville today. And down in the valley, Lubbock 90, Alpine only 82. A lot of cloud cover and some showers out in West Texas. And that's good for them. The real heat again today was much farther to the north up the plains. Nebraska, North Platte made it to 101 parts of South Dakota above 100 degrees and you look at even Wichita, Kansas, Oklahoma City hotter than us today because the big upper level heat dome is centered farther to the north of us. So far this summer, this really hasn't been sitting over us and really not influencing us directly overhead and it's the locations around it, around the periphery of it, where you often see little shower activity and storms popping up along the outer fringes of that. And that's where we are right now. So the door is still open for a few of those disturbances. And there's no indications that this is really just going to plant itself overhead and not move, at least within the next week or two. We also still have a little disturbance over Mexico. Now this came in off the Gulf of Mexico, same one we were talking about the past couple of days when it was offshore, kicking up more showers and thunderstorms and now spreading them into parts of the valley. You get to McAllen, Brownsville area, see some scattered areas of rain even stretching toward Laredo and then parts of West Texas as well, seeing a little bit of activity there. What we have right now is some isolated showers dotting the landscape in parts of the hill country and even an outflow boundary now heading toward Del Rio and Brackettville. Those of you Del Rio to Brackettville, you could see a quick shower develop as that outflow boundary creeps your way in the next hour or so. Otherwise, tomorrow and the off chance, a 10% chance of a stray shower popping up and some coastal activity right along the Gulf Coast the next couple of days. We get into early next week, Monday, Tuesday, that's when we could have a few more isolated showers developing, and that would be as a result of a weak cool front dropping into town. 92 degrees right now, but it feels like 97. It's because of these dew points that are near 70. So it feels like it's about five degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Actual air temp in Uvalde, 93, along with New Braunfels and Beeville at 90, Pleasanton, 94. As we go through the evening hours, our typical gradual drop through the 80s, not much of a breeze there for the most part, a calm wind and clearing sky as well. So tomorrow, a lot of sunshine. We'll just have some fair weather clouds by the afternoon, 75 in the morning, 94 into the afternoon, light east southeasterly breeze at five to 10. And we only bring it up a couple of degrees into the weekend to average 96 Saturday and Sunday. And then next week, we'll have to watch those rain chances. There's there's a shot that we could be increasing those odds here in the days ahead. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, if they were in Frisco or even San Antonio, the first day of pads, they'd probably be dreading. But <laughs> the weather in California, they're like, oh, bring on the pads, yeah, right? Yeah, Oxnard, put on the pads, nice yeah. and cool, get out there, get some hitting done. It's exactly what football players love to do, put on the pads and hit, especially in nice weather, and that's what the Cowboys did today. We are live in California with more on that and rookie DB Kelvin Joseph Plus out in Houston. Texans QB Deshaun Watson practiced with the team today. Coming up. Camping with KZAT, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys hit the practice field today in full pads for the first time since reporting the training camp. And with only a week left before they have to face the Steelers in the Hall of Fame game on August the 5th, every workout is important. With more on this big day, let's take you live to California and Greg Simmons. 
Larry, let me give you a quick update on Dak Prescott. Left the practice early today. He did have an MRI. They do have a muscle strain in that right throwing shoulder. They say it's going to be treated on a day-to-day basis. Dak says it is not a serious setback. There's only one player that was held out of practice today. That was Michael Gallup, and that's for what happened yesterday. Remember, Michael was going for a catch in the end zone when he crashed into the fence and went head over heels trying to haul in the timing corner pass with Drayvon Diggs all over him. Head coach Mike McCarthy telling us Gallup tweaked his ankle. Rookie cornerback Kelvin Jones. Joseph has done well meantime so far after the Cowboys made him the second-round pick out of Kentucky. His performance going forward won't be a lack of confidence with this warning. Yeah, we're going to fly around. No fly zone. <laughs> we're going to call it airplane mode. So, so when y'all drop this interview, tell them the Cowboys defense, Kelvin Joseph say airplane mode. You, you can't throw no fly zone. <laughs> Joseph revealed that he was one of those who were vaccinated but still turned up positive for COVID, forcing him to miss a week during organized team activities in May. I had the quarantine, so I just took some time to really just be in my playbook and just take time to just come back better and stronger and faster. So it pretty much, it wasn't a, a setback, probably just a setback with being away from my team. But as far as my plays, it, it really helped me so I could just really focus in and not really have to worry about too much on the outside because I'm inside quarantine. Now, even reporters covering the Cowboys must wear these contact tracing electronic devices. That means the NFL is watching us. Wildfires have also broken out here in Southern California as part of the living here. You take a look at uh, what has happened today, located on the other side of the golf course that is adjacent to the camp. According to fire officials, is running parallel to the camp. The large helicopters are performing water drops. Now coming back to you live, you can see that that wildfire has moved down away from the training camp, but still in that river basin. Just part of life in Southern California. Live in California, Greg Simmons, Case at 12 Sports. Thank you, Greg. The Houston Texans opened training camp today and quarterback Deshaun Watson was front and center practicing with his teammates. He's at camp in order to avoid being fined $50,000 for every day missed per multiple reports. Under the NFL's new collective bargaining agreement, teams can no longer forgive fines. Now, Watson is facing 22 civil lawsuits accusing him of sexual assault and sexual misconduct during massage sessions, and he wants out of Houston. So for weeks, it wasn't clear if he'd attend camp, and he's there. Today, head coach David Coley said he expected Watson to be at training camp. It was no surprise, and it was just business as usual. But why then have him there since Watson wants to be traded? Deshaun is a, is a Texan, and, and, and basically he's here. Everybody's here. And required, everybody's required to be here. Everybody that's under contract is here, and they're all here. And, and basically what training camp is for right now is for us to find out. I got 50 different guys on this football team that wasn't here last year. And when we come in here and to focus on what we need to do during training camp, then that's what we're doing. And everybody's here, and that's how we're approaching it. Texans receiver Randall Cobb tweeted a photo of himself in a Packers uniform with the caption, I'm coming home. The Texans have agreed to trade him to Green Bay. Multiple reports state that Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers wanted Cobb back as part of his agreement with the team to report to camp and play for the Packers this season, and he got his wish. Interesting. Yep. Mm. All right. Thanks, Larry. All right. Coming up next, we're still talking sports, UT football to be exact. Our KSAT Q&A is next. It is a bit of a college football alphabet soup. <laughs> OU, UT, SEC, but really it comes down to money, I think. Let's check in with Chip Brown, who is with Horns247.com. He's a good friend of mine, Chip. I appreciate you making time because I know there's all kinds of stuff going on with the Longhorn program and where they're going to be playing, when they're going to be playing. Why UT and OU? Why did they decide to go to the SEC? Well, and you mentioned there's all kinds of stuff going on and the A&M Regents just came out of an executive session and said that they will vote yes, or Kathy Banks will vote yes uh, when the SEC presidents uh, meet tomorrow and are expected to vote on Texas and Oklahoma's admission into the Southeastern Conference. And that vote is expected to go through. Um, but why is this happening, Steve? I think it's um, there's a lot of change coming to college athletics, and some of it's already happening with name, image, likeness, earnings for student athletes. And, and I think 
with the new leadership at Texas, because 10 years ago, 11 years ago, when realignment occurred, uh, Texas would have never thought of going to the SEC in part because uh, Mac Brown and DeLos Dodds um, were sort of in agreement that, you know, they weren't sure how recruiting uh, was being done, whether it was being done above board or below board. And, and now there's a new leadership group at Texas, uh, UT President Jay Hartzell, Regents Chairman Kevin Eltife, and Athletic Director Chris Del Conte. And I think they feel like the name image likeness um, for student athletes being able to earn money uh, is it sort of negates any of the previous concerns. And when you look at the playoff, likely expanding to either eight or 12 teams, uh, the sense is go play with the best, bring your fans the best games. And they're counting on Steve Sarkeesian, the new coach, to elevate the program to be competitive uh, on par with the SEC, which has dominated the college football playoff, while the Big 12, Oklahoma, has been in the college football playoff, but is yet to win a game in the college football playoff. And Oklahoma has certainly been carrying the flag for the big 12. Texas has been sort of out wandering around trying to figure things out the last 10 years after an incredible 10 years in the first decade of the 2000s. So, and let's talk about the program itself. I mean, you mentioned that the SEC is this powerhouse in football with Alabama, LSU. So for a move for UT and OU to be joining that group, joining the SEC, do you think that that is something that's going to pave the path to increase success for either of these programs? Well, it's, it's going to be high quality entertainment. I mean, you're going to get your season ticket holders to renew every year. You're not going to have to to go, you know, bring in a big name marquee non-conference opponent. In fact, Texas has Alabama on the schedule uh, for 22 and 23. They have Georgia on the schedule in 28, 29 and Florida on the schedule in 30 and 31. And part of that is just to enhance the home, you know, season ticket holder schedule because Texas fans don't get real excited about Kansas State, Kansas, um, Iowa State, Baylor, TCU. Now, that's not to say that those schools haven't been beating up on Texas because they have uh, for, you know, in and out of the last 10 years. So, you know, Texas, again, is betting on itself here, and it's not going to be easy. I mean, the Big 12 is going to, right now, is posturing Like, they're going to make this really difficult. Today, the Big 12 sent a cease and desist letter to their primary TV partner, ESPN, telling ESPN to stop talking to Big 12, uh, stop talking to Big 12 schools, stop talking about Big 12 schools to other conferences when it comes to realignment. Interesting. Basically accused ESPN of talking um, to another conference about trying to attract one of the remaining eight schools Uh, to a conference. So this is going to get crazy. Realignment always does. The passion of college athletics always uh, assists in that. All you have to do is go to Twitter to to read (laughs) all the the viewpoints on this. But it's... um, Chip, we're running, know, out of, we're running out of time here. I want to ask you one more question before I go, because I know you're well-versed in the Big 12 and in the college football landscape. What does UT and OU leaving the Big 12 mean for schools like Baylor, like Texas Tech, like TCU? Yeah, I mean, we don't know yet, but it uh, to, to me, the Pac-12 and whether, you know, they've been trying to get into the central time zone. Do they make a move to try to acquire some or all of the remaining Big 12 schools is something to watch here. Do you think the legislature steps in on this? I mean, I think Texas and Oklahoma might have been hoping that the Big 12 would be dissolved by the time the legislature meets in regular session again in 2023. Um, The remaining schools in the Big 12 are saying we need to keep Texas and OU in the Big 12 for the next four years. That's not what Texas and OU are hoping. Yeah, a lot to watch in addition to the football itself. Chip Brown with uh, Horns247.com. Thanks so much for being here. 
Thank you. Appreciate it, buddy. We'll be right back. We got your bike? Yeah, there you are. Oh, right. I don't know if we're no. still hearing you, Sam. Now we go. I think now. we got it. Yes, sir. Yeah, right. now we got it. <laughs> Should have stepped off camera there. But anyway, ramp closure. I'll move through this quickly. 90 westbound to I-35 southbound. That closes beginning in a little bit in an hour. Still watching a situation downtown I-35 at Colorado Street, and we have uh, that going on there as well. Also have a crash that's clearing here on the far west side. That's Highway 90 at uh, Pew Road. I'm going to skip through some of these other travel times because things are improving a little bit, but this is the view downtown. We showed you that crash earlier. It is now cleared at I-10 and Frio, guys. Thank you, Samuel. Getting to connect with astronauts is not something that you get to do every day. Yeah, but today local high school students got to do just that. Students and their families gathered at the San Antonio Museum of Science and Technology to speak live with NASA astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Our Sarah Acosta found out what this out of this world experience meant to students who took part. Is we're trying to use the natural resources that are already on the planet that we're going to, and we're trying to use those resources to create structures that astronauts can actually go to. 11th grader Emmett Decker is very passionate about figuring out how humans can eventually live on other planetary bodies. So to have the opportunity to speak live with NASA astronauts, he was pretty excited. To be able to communicate to those people who made that possible on the International Space Station is so incredible. Thanks to the WEX Foundation and Port San Antonio, San Antonio. Museum of Science and Technology, several students who are part of the LCATS, a four-year space STEM learning curriculum, were able to speak directly and ask questions live to NASA astronauts orbiting the Earth on the International Space Station. Students were able to speak with three NASA astronauts about things like the future of space travel and what it takes to become an astronaut. Since I was little, I've loved to study black holes, stars, galaxies, their evolutions. City Route loves space. She says this opportunity to talk to her heroes is out of this world. I'm really inspired because they worked so hard just to get where they are today. And um, I just want to know how they did it. City was able to ask her a question about the future future of commercial space travel, the astronauts said, well, the future is bright and she is hopeful she'll make it to space one day. I'm Sarah Costa, KSAT 12 News. Let's take another look outside with live cam this evening. We got some clouds out there, but another day with no real rain to talk about. Sorry, I was distracted. Our <laughs> guy running teleprompter was trying to tell me that football, American football isn't a sport because it's not in the Olympics. Oh, well. He's from he Britain. He is. Bus, he's from buddy. England. Yep. You know. Oh, we've been getting, we've been hitting him hard. Yes, we have. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why Sam turned off his mic earlier. I don't know. <laughs> he's now hiding underneath <laughs> the desk of the teleprompter back there. And your prompter is going to be going, woo, woo, really fast now. It's going to be all yeah. over the place. Yeah. That's a good point, guys. <laughs> Let's not mess with Will. He still hasn't switched it over for me. <laughs> 92 right now. We'll be down to 80 degrees at midnight. There's a few rogue showers out there in the hill country. We'll talk about that, give you an update on the tropics and African dust coming right up. Sometimes a good deed by a good dude is all it takes to make a good day. <laughs> Case in point, Brian Poirier, a Massachusetts supermarket cashier on his way to viral stardom after paying it forward for a veteran who is a little short on his grocery bill. A nurse named Renee Falcioni witnessed the act of kindness. She took to Facebook to tell the story and it's getting a lot of attention. It's a testament to the compassion that the cashier says his parents taught him. Something worth going viral. Yep. <laughs> Kindness. Kindness. Check it out. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, All right, moving to <laughs> weather right now. And, uh, you know, are we going to get to the point where the ground's going to be crispy or we're going to be complaining we need rain? I mean, are we, see, are we entering a dry period now? Uh, generally dry period, yes. And it really only takes a few weeks of our summertime sun to really start 
cracking the ground a little bit in the really exposed spots, but luckily the aquifer is in good shape. We're about eight feet above average for this time of year, and we still are drought free. There are just a few little showers out there today. We'll get to in a second. More rain chances next week, but we're not right now at least looking at anything very widespread. Seasonable temperatures, that's a, the trade off here too. It hasn't been very hot. We haven't hit 100 and that's not in the works anytime soon. Probably even through the first, maybe second week of August, we should stay near average in the mid 90s. All right, let's get to the radar screen and take a look at a little bit of activity that developed out there over the past couple of hours. We've had some isolated hit or miss showers closer to the Gulf Coastline, Victoria County earlier, Goliad County in a little bit in DeWitt County, now Carnes County starting to see just a little bit east of Kennedy in northern Live Oak County. Locally, we don't have anything to talk about in terms of showers and storms. A few of those Cumulus congestus clouds built up earlier today. They look like big popcorn kernels, but they didn't drop any showers. We are watching this outflow boundary as it moves toward Brackettville and Del Rio. There's the off chance that could kickstart an isolated shower too. West Texas getting some needed rainfall today. Throughout the day today, even uh, earlier this midday and now into the afternoon and evening, parts of the drought stricken west getting in on some action as well. Down in the valley today, some showers, especially into Mexico. That's the same disturbance we've been talking about since Monday when it was offshore. Now it's just a drifting westward, very weak, but enough to kickstart some showers and thunderstorms around it. The big blue H, the upper level high, is still centered to the north of us. And you always have clockwise circulation of wind around the highs here in the northern hemisphere. And so that puts us in this easterly flow aloft, the wind coming from the east, and it's always on the edges of those highs where you can still get some activity to develop. And well, that's what we have. So the door is open here. You look to the tropics, so quiet in the Gulf, quiet in the Caribbean, quiet in the Atlantic as well. There's really nothing out there that could even potentially develop into a tropical cyclone within the next several days. That's the way it looks right now. African dust, it's thickest out over the Atlantic, as it often is. It comes in plumes, you know, periodically, and it's over the central Atlantic. And keep in mind, the dust does have an influence on hurricane and tropical storm, tropical cyclone formation. It especially inhibits the development and even can inhibit the strengthening of an already organized storm. Anyway, this weekend we'll get just clipped by a little bit of that dust, so a little extra haze, and then we get into next week and the thickest plumes remain out to sea and don't really settle in over Texas. 92 right now, dew point 69, so it feels like 97. Divine's 94, Canyon Lake 90, and Comfort now at 91 degrees. Still hanging on to triple digits though in Del Rio. We'll start the day tomorrow at 75, make it up to about 93, 94 for the high temperature with a lot of sunshine, just some of those fair weather clouds into the afternoon and east southeasterly breeze at 5 to 10. And all across South Texas looking very similar as the past couple of days. Early next week, a little boundary is going to drop in, a weak cold front, and that could kickstart a few showers. So right now we've got 20%, but there's the possibility we could increase that in the days ahead. Okay, thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. And good morning to you. It is time to rise and shine. It is Wednesday, the July 28th. Well, definitely the words of one deputy. It was a freak accident that uh, ignited this fire. Take a look at the vehicle here on the back of this tow truck. That's all that's left of a deputy's patrol car. And it was because of a box of flares that were in the trunk. They ignited somehow as the deputy was writing a ticket for a woman and that whole car went up in flames. Police were called to a home about a suicidal man identified as Angel Sanchez threatening to kill his wife. When they arrived, they realized it was a hostage situation where Tani and our three children were being held from the name of a 51 year old man killed in a rollover crash this week. He's been identified as Manuel Gell. He died Sunday night after dr a driver jumped lanes on I-10, which caused Gell's vehicle to roll. Police say Gell wasn't wearing his seatbelt, was ejected from his vehicle. 
County Judge Nelson Wolf and Mayor Ron Nuremberg say they will be sending Governor Greg Abbott a letter, a letter asking him to support their request for additional assistance to help hospitals deal with the rising number of cases. And they also want him to allow governmental employers and schools to be able to require face masks. They noted that many students are under 12 and therefore unable to get vaccinated. Two days and the weekend is how long Judge Ron Ron Hale is giving the defense to look over the cell phone content that the state wants to present to the jury. On the phone are images of web articles from the day Detective Marconi was shot, videos and images of how to disassemble a Glock pistol, and text messages. Tomorrow we'll start the day mostly in the mid 70s by the afternoon. We make it into the mid 90s, but closer to the Rio Grande, about 100 again today. Von Army 94 tomorrow along with Seguin, Bernie 92 and Lake Hills 94. Seasonable temperatures. We're looking at conditions near average, basically our highs and even our morning lows through the weekend and into next week when we have another chance, slight chance of a few showers popping up Monday, Tuesday. Not bad to be average this time of year. Yeah. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. We'll see you back here on the night beat at 10.